All right, so uh, as, as some of you probably know, there's been in the past 10 years or so a revival of interest in genealogical arguments. I mean, it's been true in uh, contemporary psychology, it's been true in moral philosophy, where you have seen uh, a number of, uh, uh, of paper, a number of works on this topic. And of course, if you look in the, uh, in the history of philosophy, you know, the past two or three hundred years or so, uh, you, you'd be surprised by how many uh, instances of those genealogical arguments you can actually find. And of course, one of the most famous of those instances is Nietzsche's book on the genealogy of morality. Now, the distinction of Nietzsche's use of genealogical arguments in that book is that it's very unclear what kind of argument he offers. Okay, because genealogical arguments, as some of you may know, come in different varieties, and which variety uh, Nietzsche employs in that book is, uh, remains a matter of considerable debate. Now, I'm not, going to, you know, I'm not going to tell you today, I'm not going to try to figure out today what kind of genealogical argument he offers, but I'm going to take a step in that direction by focusing on a concept that plays a very central role in the book, which is the concept of ressentiment. Uh, Nietzsche invokes ressentiment as uh, an essential factor in accounting for the emergence of a number of, of, of all, basically all the main features of the modern moral outlook uh, that, that he takes on in the book. Okay? That includes, of course, uh, the moral values of good and evil, that includes the concept of moral guilt, and things of that nature. Okay, so I'm going to focus on, on this concept of ressentiment. Now, before I, I get to the issue itself, uh, which is uh, a little bit thorny, uh, I just need to make uh, a preliminary terminological point. So the concept of ressentiment is a French term that Nietzsche borrows and uses, uses the French version, uh, clearly because he intends it to have some kind of technical meaning. And uh, this French term is obviously supposed to translate the English resentment. But I think it's very important for us uh, to distinguish ressentiment from the English resentment, at least insofar as the English concept has take, now taken on a moral meaning. As such, as you probably know, resentment designates the response I have to someone who fails to discharge their moral obligations towards me. And as such, it figures in the, in the trilogy of moral reactive attitudes alongside indignation, which is the response I have when someone fails to discharge their moral obligations generally, and guilt, which is the response that I have to myself when I fail to discharge my own moral obligations. Ressentiment cannot be moral resentment for Nietzsche because it is invoked as a possible origin for moral values and must therefore exist prior to the responses that these values underwrite. So it's very important when you think of ressentiment not to think immediately of the English resentment, which now has taken on that moral connotation. Okay, let's, let's turn to the analysis of ressentiment itself. So most of the analyses of ressentiment, uh, of Nietzsche's concept of ressentiment in the literature, focus on what may be the best known example of it, which is the example in the first essay of the genealogy of morality. In that famous example, we are invited to imagine two aristocratic groups, which he calls them the priests and the warriors respectively, who compete for what he calls the high rank. And I'm going to suppose that what he means by that is something like social dominance. The stronger warriors initially gain the upper hand, and this arouses the ressentiment of the priests, and the priests, being themselves members of the aristocracy, also value social dominance, but their weakness prevents them from achieving it. So in other words, what Nietzsche describes here is a generic situation in which two individuals or groups of individuals compete for the possession of a coveted good. One individual or group is too weak to secure possession of the group, which the other is strong enough to acquire. The ressentiment this situation arouses in the weaker party is a form of revengeful ill will that is directed against a stronger rival. It therefore appears to be, in the word of one commentator, are a social sentiment, an essentially social sentiment, in the sense that it is essentially directed at other agents or persons. Because of their weakness, however, the weak are denied revenge through actions that are directly damaging to the interests of their stronger rivals. And as a consequence, according to the GD, they resort to a peculiar strategy. And this is, a, this is one quote I'm going to read. He describes it as a radical revaluation of the enemy's values, that is to say, an act of the most spiritual revenge. So unable to recover, to recover the position of social dominance they lost to their rivals, they now radically devalue it. It and the desire for it ought to be repudiated as evil. Now at this point, 
we run up against an interpretive puzzle, which concerns the purpose of this revaluation. Nietzsche admittedly sometimes describes it in strategic terms. So he uses phrases like a grand politics of revenge or a premeditated revenge by the weak. And this revenge aims to inflict some sort of harm on the stronger rivals. And Nietzsche also sometimes suggests that the revaluation is intended to achieve this aim of harming the stronger rival by inducing in them tormenting feelings of guilt or shame. So the next quote on uh, under number one is uh, about that. So to achieve this objective, according to this view, the weak represents the traits and states of affairs that are valued by the strong, including social dominance as evil. To persuade the strong to embrace these values, he pre presents them as universal or unconditional norms. And to get them to be troubled by their failure to live up to these norms, he contrives the fiction of free will to induce them to think that they are to blame for such a failure and to experience pain painful feelings of guilt over it. So when successful then, in this view, the revaluation might induce them to give up their position of social dominance, but even if it does not, it would make it virtually impossible for them to enjoy it any longer. Now, this strategic interpretation of the revaluation that ressentiment motivates runs into a serious difficulty. For the weak to resort to it strategically as a means to harm their stronger rivals looks practically inconsistent. The revaluation is an effective means to harm the strong only if the strongs can be expected to accept the new moral outlook and consequently to become tormented by feelings of guilt. But the weak has absolutely no reason to expect the strong to accept that outlook, since the strong's evaluative commitments and their position of social dominance give them every reason simply to ignore the new evaluative rhetoric of the weak. Now here's all the problem. Nietzsche also describes the revaluation as self-deception, self -de what he calls specifically the self-deception of impotence. This suggests that this revaluation will achieve its aim only if the weak himself internalizes the new values it creates. And in terms of the strategic interpretation I just described, this makes no sense. For the revaluation to succeed in harming the strong, the weak only need to persuade them to accept the new outlook. He doesn't have to accept that outlook himself. Okay? Now, maybe we might suppose that this self-deception is a part of the strategy, an element in the strategy of revenge. Perhaps the weak must internalize the new evaluative outlook in order to preach it convincingly. Perhaps one is a better proselytizer if one is, if one is oneself a believer. Okay? Now, if we accept this supposition, however, we run into a new difficulty. It now threatens to make the strategy psychologically incoherent. Okay? For the internalization by the weak of the new values deprives them of the very ground for seeking revenge in the first place. And so of their very ability to enjoy it if it is successful. If he deems social dominance evil, the torment that befall, the torments that befall those who seek and possess it will be cause of some satisfaction for him, but it cannot be the satisfaction of revenge. Indeed, for the weak to take vengeful pleasure at the pangs of conscience of his stronger rivals would be objectionable from the perspective of his new values and would immediately uh, arouse pangs of conscience in him. Moreover, as Nietzsche describes it, the self-deception is not simply a part or an element in the strategy of revenge. It is the whole operation. And this has two implications, I think. First, this suggests that it cannot be the sort of instrumental calculation the strategic interpretation represents it to be. An agent who deceives himself does something in order to achieve an objective, of course. For example, the weak alters his beliefs in order to satisfy his desire for revenge. But this process of self-deception cannot be explicitly or self-consciously governed by the logic of instrumental rationality. To be successful, the weak self-deception requires that he do not regard the alteration of his beliefs as a means to, to satisfy his revengeful wishes. That's the first point. Second point, self-deception is designed typically to benefit those who are subject to it. This suggests that the aim of revaluation is not so much to cause psychological torments to his stronger rivals, but to procure psychological benefits to the weak himself. So, this is the line I'm going to, to follow. 
And in the recent literature, we can find two distinct analyses of ressentiment that treat it as an essentially social sentiment, but also take the purpose of revaluation, the revaluation that ressentiment motivates, not to be harming those at whom it is directed, but rather uh, to be benefiting those who perform the revaluation. And I will consider now each of these two interpretations. On your handout, this is number two, ressentiment is malicious envy, and then number three, ressentiment is an impulse to blame. Now, the very structure of Nietzsche's genealogy examples, uh, example invites a comparison of ressentiment with envy because ressentiment shares the characteristically triangular structure of envy. It involves a subject of envy, the weak, an envied other, the strong, and a good for the possession of which the other is envied, in the example social dominance. To distinguish ressentiment from envy, some philosophers point out to the desire to harm the envied other, which they take to be essential to ressentiment, but not to envy. So basically, they take ressentiment to be a malicious form of envy. Now, those who take this line of interpretation implicitly identify envy with what philosophers sometimes call benign or emulative envy. To envy someone for the possession of a coveted good in this benign view simply involves the positive desire to acquire that good for, you, for oneself. In conditions in which the envious object, subject is systematically barred from acquiring the coveted good for himself, his envy gives rise now to a kind of ill will that's directed at the envied other. The weak now wishes to harm his stronger rivals, for example, by depriving them of the coveted good, or at least of the advantages that its possession might seem to confer. According to, this philo to these philosophers, this sort of malicious ill will is no longer envy, strictly speaking, but it's ressentiment. On reflection, however, if you think about it for a minute, this is not a promising way of distinguishing ressentiment from envy. For the negative desire to harm the envied other seems to be a constitutive part of envy. We can see this when we consider that the benign conception of envy, if you reduce envy to what I've called the benign conception, makes it very difficult to distinguish envy from the mere desire for some good, the coveted good. Envy does not simply consist of the conjunction of the desire for some good with the belief that somebody has it. To fancy someone's beautiful car is not yet to envy him for it. When I envy some time, some, someone for their beautiful car, my focus is less on the good that they possess than on the fact that they possess it and I don't. Okay? <clears throat> this explains why envy is, as some other philosophers have pointed out, a disjunctive motivation. It can give rise either to the positive desire to acquire the coveted good for oneself, or, presumably when that coveted good is perceived to be out of one's reach, to the negative desire to have the other deprived of it, or somehow, uh, somehow deprived of the advantage that it gives him. We can see how both desires now, the positive and the negative one, are manifestations of envy once we recognize that the focus of envy is the difference of possession rather than the coveted good itself, and both, since both desires now can be seen as aiming at eliminating the difference of possession. Okay. If I acquire the good for myself, then there's no difference between you and me. If I can't acquire it, but I deprive you of it, then there's no difference between you and me either. Okay. So in Nietzsche's example, obviously the malicious side of envy is activated since the subject of envy is described as being in circumstances in which the positive way of alleviating the painful tension of envy is not available. Try as hard as he can, the weak is unable to wrestle social dominance away from his stronger rivals. He becomes afflicted with what Nietzsche calls a feeling of impotence, and this feeling arouses and fuels ill will towards his stronger rivals. We might then concede that ressentiment simply is envy, and suppose that the aim of revaluation is to eliminate the painful tension of envy. Now, the circumstances described in Nietzsche's example are still special, insofar as the weak can neither secure possession of the good for which he envies his stronger rival, but he cannot deprive them of it either. And so the devaluation of that good is the only way in which he can eliminate the painful tension of envy, 
because it allows him no longer to see his stronger rivals as better off than he is for, for possessing social dominance. Okay? Now, this line of interpretation, I think, runs into uh, significant difficulties. The first is that by reducing it to envy, it threatens to deprive ressentiment of a distinctive psychological identity. If ressentiment just is a form of envy, why the burdensome and confusing recourse to an 18th century French term with a notoriously obscure meaning? I mean, I'm a native speaker of French myself. I, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you on the face of it what ressentiment means. Okay, so why not simply calling it for what it in fact is, envy? If, it, if, if ressentiment is envy, why does Nietzsche talk about ressentiment and envy in the same sentence as if they were different things, right? Second, on this view, it's also hard to see how uh, the revaluation of social dominance could count as revenge, because the weak cannot suppose it to cause harm to his stronger rivals, since they, the stronger rivals, are no longer presumed to accept these, value, these new values themselves. And this points to a third difficulty, that revenge is typically motivated by the belief that the other, who is the object of my revenge, has somehow hurt me. For example, that he is the cause of my deprivation. But this is not essential to envy. I can envy another for the possession of a good uh, that I want without seeing his possession of it as the cause of my deprivation. And even if I see him as the cause of my deprivation without believing that he has thereby caused me harm. Okay. So let me now turn to the second line of interpretation. The second line of interpretation explores precisely these characters of ressentiment, that it is, you know, uh, it induces you to see somebody else as the cause of your suffering. In this analysis, ressentiment is not simply the hate-filled desire to retaliate that is typically motivated by the belief that someone is the cause of my misery. The distinction of ressentiment is that it motivates precisely such a belief. Ressentiment is a response to suffering in general that consists in seeking someone to blame for it. So in this interpretation, Ressentiment is not a social sentiment by virtue of being a response to a social situation. It is a social sentiment by virtue of turning what is essentially a private affair, the suffering of the lone individual, into a social one. In Nietzsche's example, the suffering of the weak is caused by the frustration of his social ambition, which he proceeds, naturally enough, to blame on his stronger rivals. So the next quote on your, the next major quote on your handout is about that. Uh, so under number three, every sufferer instinctively seeks a cause for his suffering. Now, here too, unable to achieve revenge to acts, through acts that are directly damaging to his rival's interest, the weak resorts to a spiritual revenge, a revaluation of values. By, but in this case, it, it functions a bit differently. By judging evil, the social dominance enjoyed by his rivals, the weak can blame them for it and find some comfort in his own moral goodness or superiority, as Nietzsche puts it. There's a quote about that too. Now, the philosophers who advocate this interpretation insist that the aim of revaluation is not to harm others who are chosen as the object of blame, for example, by inducing them to adopt an outlook that would cause them to feel guilty. It is rather to endow the weak himself with an outlook that allows him to indulge in a fantasy in which others are evil and blameworthy, and he himself is righteous. This moral fantasy is not intended to eliminate the suffering, but it makes possible an emotional discharge through the act of blaming or relishing his moral superiority, the sheer intensity of which is supposed to numb, anesthetize, or simply drown out his suffering. Okay, so I suffer, I'm looking for somebody to blame, and then the, the affect of blaming them uh, is intense enough to drown out my suffering, to make me, to drive it, as Nietzsche puts it, to drive it out of my consciousness. Now, this interpretation also has its own problems, okay? First, if the objective is simply to deaden or anesthetize pain by means of affects, why resort to these particular affects? the effects of blaming, of thinking oneself morally superior. Feeling morally superior to those who inflict suffering upon us may be especially effective at alleviating that suffering, okay? But we still want to know why, okay? Now the problem grows more acute, I think, 
and threatens the view with incoherence, when we consider Nietzsche's view that the person who suffers may turn the fantasy of blame on himself and find relief from his suffering in blaming himself, in feeling guilty for it. For in this case, the strategy seems like it substitutes one kind of pain, the torments of guilt, for another, the torments of frustration. And if the objective of this strategy simply is to deaden pain by means of affects, it seems that other affects, especially pleasurable affects, might make more sense. I mean, as I mentioned in the class, the drunken debauchery might some comes to mind here. So we are just left wondering here why the pain of guilt is preferable to the pain of frustration. Okay? This is one problem. But the double problem here, I'm, I'm, there's many more problems, but I'm just going to focus on these two. The second problem is that here too, it is unclear how the, re how the revaluation can count as revenge. If we, suppose to, if we suppose revenge to require that harm be inflicted on the offending party. While the weak can make use of the new outlook to disparage others as morally inferior and blameworthy, he cannot consistently intend this disparagement actually to harm them. Nietzsche repeatedly presents the revaluation motivated by ressentiment as an imaginary revenge, in which stronger others are harmed only in effigy, as he puts it. But it is unclear how this could help the present life of interpretation. The stronger others will be harmed by this disparagement of them only if they accept the new moral outlook. And it seems as inconsistent for the weak to imagine that they would do so as it is to believe it. Perhaps then we might say that revenge is imaginary insofar as the weak only pretends that the other people are harmed. Okay? But if such pretense suffices for revenge, it becomes quite difficult to see why revaluation must be a part of it at all. In fact, it begins to look like a needless, cumbersome complication. Why is it not enough for the weak to imagine, for example, that he has an almighty God on his side who will eventually strike down his rivals? Okay. Why the complications of changing the values? So neither of the two lines of interpretation I have so far considered is without problems. The first offers a straightforward account of the revaluation ressentiment motivates, but it fails to explain how it could constitute a form of revenge, and it also deprives ressentiment of a distinctive identity by reducing it to envy. The second attributes a distinctive identity to ressentiment, but it has difficulties making sense both of the character of the revaluation it motivates and of the manner in which it's supposed to constitute revenge. So we need a fresh start here. As a fresh start, the first thing that I'm going to propose to you is to challenge the assumption that these two lines of interpretation share, which is the assumption that ressentiment is essentially a social sentiment, that it is directed at other persons or agents. In Nietzsche's view, as it turns out, ressentiment can be felt towards impersonal, non-agential entities like life, actuality, time. And I have uh, three quotes on the handout uh, that, uh, that show that to you. Okay? Again, I'm not going to read them. Now, if you take a quick look at them, however, you'll notice that in all these instances, ressentiment is described as a response to suffering. And that when this response, this ressentiment motivates a revaluation, it is also a response to what he calls a feeling of impotence or inability. This is a feature that all these examples have in common with the example of uh, the first essay of the genealogy I've been discussing. Okay? The, the ressentiment of the, the characters Nietzsche called the priest there, or the weak, it is also caused by suffering, namely the frustration of their social ambition, and it is when it's accompanied by a feeling of impotence that it motivates a revaluation of the frustrated ants. On this point, there's widespread agreement among scholars. Generally well understood, however, and this is where I'm going to uh, require your attention. Generally well understood is the significance of the close connection that Nietzsche repeatedly draws in those uh, passages between suffering on the one hand and what he calls impotence or inability on the other. And to understand this connection, it will be helpful to turn briefly to Schopenhauer's philosophical psychology. And there's one thing that Schopenhauer does that's very interesting. He distinguishes between pain and suffering. Okay. The, the German words are pain, for pain is Schmerz, and for suffering is Leiden. And pain is essentially an experience of deprivation, which is caused by the fact that a desire I have goes unsatisfied. 
Suffering, by contrast, is an experience of frustration. And I have a quote from Schopenhauer on the handout here. He says, all suffering is nothing but unfulfilled and thwarted willing. Now, it's crucial to note that Schopenhauer speaks here not of unsatisfied desire, but of thwarted willing. This suggests that while an unsatisfied desire may elicit pain, it doesn't necessarily elicit suffering. It is only when I will to satisfy a desire that I experience its going unsatisfied as suffering. So what does willing involve? Well, some philosophers, including Nietzsche, suggest that I cannot will an end unless I consider it good. Now, while Schopenhauer agrees, he does not take it to be what distinguishes willing from what he calls wishing or merely desiring. Even if judging an end good is a necessary feature of willing, in other words, it's not a sufficient feature of it. I can come to wish or merely desire an end because I consider it good without, however, coming to will it. So I can wish for peace on earth, or I wish I could play the violin because I recognize in them valuable ends, and yet not resolve to pursue them. What distinguishes willing from wishing or merely desiring is precisely this element of resolve. The German word Schopenhauer uses is Anschluss. So the notion, of revol- the re- excuse me, notion of resolve is somewhat ambiguous in Schopenhauer. On the one hand, it designates what you may call the resolution of a practical question that the agent faces, the conclusion of a deliberation that typically takes the form of settling for one among a menu of practical options. On the other hand, resolve also designates the resoluteness to carry out the open option, the chosen option, excuse me, through uh, appropriate action. This means that when I resolve to pursue an end, I engage my agency in its pursuit. In fact, for Schopenhauer, I have not genuinely resolved to pursue the end unless I so engage my agency. So in Schopenhauer's terminology, winning an end is, implies, as he puts it, striving for it. In, in Schopenhauer's conception of deliberation, these two senses of resolve are related, but it is the sense of resoluteness that matters for the characterization of suffering. The fact that I desire, the fact to me that the desire that I did not will to satisfy goes unsatisfied may cause, as I say, the painful sense of deprivation. Or even, if the desire was motivated by a recognition of the value of its object, regret or disappointment. But since it does not engage my agency, however, it cannot affect my sense of its effectiveness. Such deprivation elicits pain, but not suffering, strictly speaking, because suffering is not, in the first instance, the registration of the loss of a good. It is a registration of the inability to secure its possession. It is an experience of frustration, which denotes thwarted effort, and is experienced by the agent as a challenge to the effectiveness of his agency. So let us return to the case of the weak in Nietzsche's example. Their ressentiment is aroused by their failure to achieve social dominance, an end which they value. Now, common responses to the failure to realize a valued end come in different varieties, ranging from regret to indignation. Regret, for example, is a response that focuses on the value of the frustrated end. There's something good I didn't get. Since their ressentiment evidently differs from regret, the weak then cannot simply be supposed to deplore the loss of a valued good. Indignation, by contrast, is a response that focuses on the agent's entitlement to some good. But ressentiment is also clearly a different response. As Nietzsche emphatically points out, it inspires vengefulness, not the demand for just retribution. We would expect a genuine sense of entitlement to motivate. So ressentiment differs from regret and indignation, in my view, in virtue of being focused on the agent's inability to get what he wills. In other words, ressentiment is a response neither to the loss of a good nor to the the violation of his right to it, but to a lack of power. This is why it bears a connection to the feeling of impotence. So ressentiment is thus a response to frustration when it is experienced as an injury to the feeling of power. Nietzsche describes it sometimes as the gnawing worm of injured ambition, where ambition is understood simply as the desire to show that you can, that you have certain capacities or abilities. So in Nietzsche's view, ressentiment is a normal response to suffering. This means that everyone, and not just those he calls the weak and impotent, is susceptible to it. 
and uh, the quote, the next quote on the uh, on the handout uh, indicates that. Uh, this is the quote: uh, "Ressentiment itself should it appear in the noble man, etc., and so on, so on, so forth." Now, while it is a normal response to suffering, ressentiment is not an inevitable response to it. Suffering, as you recall, is frustration, the experience of resistance in the exercise of one's agency. It is therefore bound to raise some doubts about its effectiveness. Now, the, the agent who experiences a setback in the pursuit of some end may form doubts about the effectiveness of some particular way in which she was trying to realize that end. But such particular doubts do not necessarily awaken doubts about her general capacity to realize that, that goal, that end. Ressentiment, I think, is a response to these more general sorts of doubts. It motivates a desire to prove oneself, as we might say, which is not simply to realize a goal, but to demonstrate that one can. Presumably, this general doubt grows in the agent out of the more particular sort of doubt about her effectiveness. For example, it's the repeated failure of different strategies in the pursuit of some goal that might make the prospect of general ineffectiveness more likely. Or the habitual ineffectiveness in the pursuit of various goals may lead the agent to form a view of herself as generally weak, one, what Nietzsche sometimes calls a born failure, or failure from the start. And to conclude more hastily from a particular setback in the pursuit of a particular goal to her general ineffectiveness. And this would explain why the strong time, in the strong type of individual, uh, ressentiment, and I quote here from the passage I mentioned earlier, fails to appear at all on countless occasions on which it inevitably appears in the weak and impotent. These occasions presumably refer to experiences liable to illicit ressentiment, that is to say experiences of failure in the pursuit of one's goals. Now the strength of individuals of this type give them the confidence to regard such failures as nothing more than temporary setbacks, which do not raise necessarily general doubts about the effectiveness of, of their agency. And if some part of your experience of failure does raise such doubt, general doubts in them and arouses that, their ressentiment, then their strength typically allows them to mount a successful immediate reaction that, as Nietzsche puts it, consummates and exhausts that ressentiment. By contrast, those whom Nietzsche calls the weak and impotent are not only more likely to experience ressentiment, but also unable as they are to consummate it in an immediate reaction to compound that ressentiment with a feeling of impotence. In that case, the revenge ressentiment motivates may become spiritual or imaginary. For example, it may take the form of a revaluation of values. This is the passage uh, in, towards the bottom of page three that begins the slave revolt in morality begins when ressentiment itself becomes creative and it happens in natures that are denied a true reaction and so on. So unable to regain the higher rank from their strong, for his stronger rivals, the weak resorts to an act of the most spiritual revenge. He devaluates the very idea of a higher rank. He now regards it and the hankering for it as morally evil. Nietzsche leaves no doubt about the meaning of this revaluation. And I quote here, it's also on, your, uh, on the handout, uh, the, next, uh, the next to the last bullet point on the page. This, he says, Listen too calmly and without previous bias really amounts to no more than we weak ones are after all weak. It is good if we do nothing for which we are not strong enough. The purpose of this revaluation is therefore the alleviation of the feeling of impotence and not the desire to harm others. It is, in other words, the will to power of the individual, what Nietzsche calls his desire to feel powerful, that induces the weak to devaluate their own values when they have become intolerable reminders of his impotence. Now this interpretation, of course, avoids the problem of practical inconsistency, since the achievement of its aim requires that only the weak accept the new values, and it also explains how revaluation so understood could constitute a form of revenge. Why? Well, because revenge can plausibly be understood as an assertion of power. Suppose you have been harmed in some way. For example, somebody has taken something from you. Exacting revenge does not necessarily aim at recovering the lost good. Revenge may be deemed appropriate even when the lost good is not recoverable. Okay? 
suppose you, I mean, to use a particularly gory example, suppose you kill my child. You know, I may still want revenge on you, even if that, that's not going to bring my child back. Okay. Moreover, as Nietzsche insists, revenge also differs from retribution or compensation for the violation of your right to that good. This suggests that revenge is motivated neither by the valuation of the lost good, nor by the belief that you have a right to it. Rather, it is motivated by the desire to meet what you perceive as a challenge to the effectiveness of your agency, or to repair your injured feeling of power. Now, while exacting revenge often takes the form of inflicting harm on another whom you perceive to be the cause of your own suffering, it is primarily intended as an assertion of power, specifically a demonstration that the other whom you are now beating up does not pose an insurmountable challenge to the effectiveness of your agency. Now, as Nietzsche's extension of revenge to impersonal entities suggests, this objective may be achieved without making somebody else suffer. The object of revenge may cease to be a challenge to the effectiveness of your agency, for example, if you change your values in such a way that you need no longer see its presence as impeding your, rehabilita your ability to realize that. Okay? So that would be the sense in which it counts as revenge. All right. So now we have a, a grip on what ressentiment is. Now I want to consider, to conclude, two questions. First, what does the susceptibility to ressentiment show about our human psychology? And second, what is it about ressentiment that makes it especially apt to disrupt the agent's beliefs about values? Okay? So I'm going to take each question in turn. Ressentiment for Nietzsche is an affect. And in Nietzsche's view, affects typically, and I can say more about this in discussion, manifest drives, at least insofar as the presence and arousal of a particular drive is a condition of the very susceptibility to the particular affect. So the affect of sexual jealousy, for example, reveals the existence of a sexual drive insofar as this drive is a condition of the susceptibility to the affect. So what does the susceptibility to ressentiment reveal about the human repertoire of drives? Well, in the first place, it reveals the existence of a special drive Nietzsche identifies as the will to power. Now, in the most general terms, the will to power is, and I'm going to use uh, terminology that, uh, that I borrow from Nietzsche, that comes straight out of Nietzsche, okay? It's the desire to bend the world to my will, or the desire to impose my own form of the world on the world, which is a matter of shaping it in accordance with my values. Now, Nietzsche's characterization of the concept of power is framed by two terms. The first is the term mastery, the German Herrschaft, which designates what we have in mind in English when we speak about having power over something or someone. This presumably refers to the simple conformity of world to will. The second term is competence, Tuchtigkeit in German, which designates now the power to achieve some goals. So I'm a, I have French competence, for example, if I have the power to speak French. You know, in that sense. Uh, <clears throat> now, this presumably refers now to the capacity to make the world conform to my will. Now, in Nietzsche's conception of power, these two notions are inextricably connected. Mastery requires competence, and the evidence of competence lies in the achievement of mastery. Okay, let me elaborate on this a little bit. The mere conformity of the world to my will is a necessary, but not a sufficient condition of my mastery over it. So let me give you an example that Nietzsche himself evokes. When they dwelt in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve lived in a world that by and large conformed to their will. Okay. Yet, as it eventually became painfully evident to them, they didn't have mastery over that world. The reason is simply that the conformity of that world to their will was neither a product of the effectiveness of their agency, nor something their agency was effective at maintaining. Genuine mastery, therefore, requires effective agency. There's no power over the world without the power to bend it to my will. And I can know that I have this power, that I possess the competence or effectiveness required to bend the world to my will, 
only by achieving mastery, by actually bending the world to my will. The will to power, therefore, is not simply the de a desire for the conformity of the world to my will. I mean, wanting the world to conform to my will is nothing over and above simply having that will. But it's a desire, rather, for such conformity insofar as it is a product of the, of the exercise of my effective agency. For present purposes, we may say that the will to power is a desire for effective agency and for conformity of the world to my will insofar as it is evidence of such effectiveness, insofar as it is my achievement, as we might want to say. So that's the first point. Right? Ressentiment shows that we have this a particular, that our motivational psychology includes that will, for, that will to power, the desire to be effective agents. In the second place, the susceptibility to ressentiment also reveals that the will to power is an independent motivation. And by this I mean that the desire for effective agency is independent from the desire for the ends one values. Now this is a bit perplexing on the face of it, right? Since after all, it seems as though the, the reason you, are, you, you may have a desire to be effective agents only because you, ha you have an interest in realizing certain ends for which this effectiveness would be necessary. But Nietzsche says that the desire to be effective agents is independent from your desire for the valued ends for the realization of which that effectiveness would be required. And he gives uh, various arguments, but one argument that he gives, or one piece of evidence that he gives for that motivational independence of the will to power, is precisely the fact that ressentiment can motivate, under circumstances, a revaluation of values, specifically a devaluation of the ends that the agent feels unable to realize. This fact could not be explained unless we suppose human beings to have an interest in being effective agents that is independent from their valuation of the ends such agency would be effective at realizing. If the interest in effective agency manifested in ressentiment were instrumentally or prudentially dependent on the valuation of those ends, then the devaluation of them would simply make no sense as a way of appeasing their ressentiment. Okay. So that's the answer to the first of the two questions that I raised. What does ressentiment show about our motivational psychology? That we have this motivation, this desire to be effective agents, and that this motivation is a kind of independence. Yet, now I turn to the final question. You know, why ressentiment is especially apt to disrupt beliefs about value? Yet, there must be a special dependence of the agent's feeling of power on her values. Otherwise, it would be hard to see how changing her values could restore her feeling of power. In this case, however, and I'll skip over a number of details here, but in this case, however, the dependence is not instrumental or prudential. It is, you might say, constitutive. And it is a consequence of the fact that power is a purely formal concept. The will to power, remember, is the desire by the agent to bend the world to her will. So what counts as power for her, therefore, must get its determinate content from the content of her will. That is to say, from the determinate ends she values. An agent cannot aim at effectiveness as such, but only in connection with the pursuit of these ends. It may well be, of course, that being effective in pursuing certain ends might induce her to value them, but she must first come to value them before she can derive a feeling of power from their successful pursuit. So if the pursuit of power now is so constitutively dependent on the agent's valuations of other ends, if her values in other ways determine what counts as power for her, then her pursuit of power cannot coherently conflict with the value that she attributes to these other ends. To put it another way, she cannot demonstrate her, the effectiveness of her agency without also affirming the values that give it a determinate content. This is why the will to power the concern to be an effective agent is especially apt to disrupt the agent's valuations. This is particularly true, as Nietzsche notes, in the cases in which the threats posed to that effectiveness by her failure and frustrations not only arouse her ressentiment, but also compound it with a feeling of impotence. For in such cases, the agent can no longer satisfy her will to power, her desire to feel powerful, without altering her values. Thank you.